Thank you so much, uh, my dear brothers, for leading us today in worship. We're so grateful for the church of um, the, the school of church music and for what they uh, for what they do for us in chapel uh, every week. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dockery, for the invitation to uh, to bring the message today from Philippians chapter two. It's my great honor and privilege to to go through this text with us today and. Uh, to the executive committee that's here today, um, and please know the faculty is grateful to you and we're praying for you as you uh, guide the school, I'm praying that God will give you his wisdom. If you'll take your Bibles and look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, we've already read the text, um, so we'll jump right in. There are two features of our text in its context uh, that will help us to understand and to appreciate and to apply this text. First, there are two key themes in the letter of Philippians that come together in this passage. This passage looks both backward and forward as we move from chapter 1 into chapter 2. The two key, key themes that come together in this passage are the themes of unity, which is the dominant theme, and the theme of joy. This passage is actually an extension of chapter 1, verses 27 to 30, and this is uh, marked by the word so in verse 1. Some translations might have the word therefore or the word then. In the prior passage, Paul sets forth his expectation of unity and the importance of unity when he says that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. To live this way, Paul tells us in verse 27, is to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So in light of his expectation and in light of its importance to the gospel, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, Paul makes a strong appeal for unity. The other theme is joy. Joy also plays a significant role in the letter. So the two themes, unity and joy, come together in this passage. And Paul makes an astounding statement, or actually it's a command. He says in verse 2, complete my joy or make my joy full or fulfill my joy, which is then followed by an exhortation to unity. You see, a lack of unity in the body of Christ diminishes our joy. While it is true that there is a sense in which joy is not defined by our circumstances, after all, Paul says in chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, the circumstance of disunity impairs our joy. Joy is not all that it could be or should be when there's the lack of unity in the body of Christ. Why is this true? Well, it is true because it is God's desire for his people. Jesus prayed that they might be one even as we are one. This is true because to live in unity is to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. And if we're not living in a manner worthy of the gospel, then our joy cannot be full. It cannot be all that it should be. It is also true because being part of the family of God is a deeply personal thing. Believers matter to one another. The church is the body of Christ, and God has so composed the body that we are dependent upon one another. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, if one member suffers, all suffer. If one member is honored, then all rejoice together. Philippians is perhaps the most personal letter that Paul writes. Paul's deep affection and his joy for them comes across strong in the letter. For example, in chapter 1, we've already seen where Paul says, When I pray for you, I thank my God for every remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy. This joy was rooted in their partnership in the gospel and in the confidence that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, verses five and six. Paul says in chapter one, verse seven, it is 
It is right for me to think of you in this way because I have you in my heart. And in verse eight, he says, God is my witness how I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul desired joy for his converts. He was confident that he would remain for a while with them for your progress and joy in the faith, chapter one, verse 25. And later in the letter in chapter four, he just says it to them, you are my joy and my crown. Paul was not a detached, impersonal theologian. He was an apostle commissioned by Jesus Christ, a missionary, evangelist, church planter. Paul and the Philippians were engaged in the same conflict And Paul reminds them in chapter one, verse seven, you all are partakers of grace with me. And so the first feature of this text that helps us to understand it and appreciate it are the themes of unity, which is the dominant theme, but also the theme of joy. These two themes are closely knit together. The second feature of this text that is important to help us to understand it and to apply it is the function of the text. What is Paul doing in this text? In this text, Paul writes to persuade. This is impassioned pleading. As one commentator put it, words brimming with emotional force. There's only one sentence in Greek, verses one to four. Sometimes the statements are a bit vague and they're compressed, but this is intentional. Phrase piled upon phrase, a deeply personal exhortation. Just think about the words that you find in this text. Words like encouragement, comfort, fellowship or participation, compassion, mercy, joy, love. And there's an adjective in in verse two that takes more than one English word typically to translate it, uh, souls together, which English translations typically render united in spirit or being in full accord or harmonious. This is language that stirs the soul. This is motivation. This is pleading. The Philippians would have had this letter read to them. And so Paul writes with emotion and appeal to motivate them to unity. I want us to look at three things briefly this morning as we look at this text in light of these two features. Number one, the basis of unity in verse one. Number two, the call to and the essence of unity in verse two. And number three, the path to unity in verses three to four, which is humility. Unity through humility. First, we'll look at the basis of unity in chapter two, verse one. There are four conditional clauses, but these are not probabilities or possibilities. These are realities and certainties of the Christian life. Remember, this is powerful rhetoric. In Greek, there's no verbs, and so English translations supply the verbs in the conditional clauses. Some English translations omit the repeated if, but in Greek, it's repeated every time, if, 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 and this is for rhetorical effect and for persuasion. Paul writes to persuade by recalling what they have in common as he prefaces the call to unity that follows. The first clause in verse one. If there is any encouragement in Christ. Now the word translated encouragement is capable of different translations. It can sometimes be translated exhortation. But likely encouragement in the sense of comfort in relation to their common experience of suffering is the meaning here. The NIV unpacks this phrase a bit more by translating it, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. And likely what Paul has in mind here, he's just mentioned in the previous passage, the the suffering 
that they both share. And so likely Paul is encouraging them in light of their suffering and in light of their union with Christ. We see Paul's theology of comfort in light of suffering in another passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 when he opens the letter where the same noun occurs and the verb together, they appear 10 times in the span of just a few verses. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 7, Paul opens that letter in this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. This seems to be what Paul is doing in, for the Philippians in this passage, considering that he's just mentioned suffering in the previous passage in 127 to 30. Paul frequently refers to his imprisonment, and God has comforted him, and so he now is comforting them. There is encouragement, there is comfort in knowing, for example, that suffering is a sign of salvation in 128. There is comfort in knowing that suffering is a gift, 129. There is comfort in knowing that they are engaged in the same struggle with Paul, chapter 1, verse 30. And there's comfort, as Paul says, in 121 in knowing that to live is Christ and to die is gain. If there is any encouragement from being united with Christ, and there's plenty to be encouraged about when we're in union with Christ. Look at the second phrase. If there is any comfort or consolation of love. Now, there's a different word used here, but it is probably synonymous with the word used in the previous clause. Much like in English, the words encouragement, comfort, consolation can mean the same thing. Again, this is persuasion. This is pleading. But when Paul says, if there's any comfort from love, whose love is he talking about? The NIV adds his love, indicating that it is Christ or God's love that comforts his people, but the scope of the letter includes Christ's love for the church, Paul's love for the Philippians, their love for him, and the love of believers for one another. So it's likely all-encompassing. The verb form of this word appears in John 11 with reference to those who comforted or consoled Mary and Martha in the death of their brother Lazarus. Similarly, Paul instructed the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5.14 to comfort the disheartened. Paul has already acknowledged in chapter one that, their, that love is present in the community and he is praying that their love will increase even more in knowledge and discernment in order to be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruits of righteousness through Jesus Christ to the praise and the glory of God. And that's what love does. Love encourages, it comforts, it seeks the highest good for others. The third clause, if there is any participation, or perhaps your translation says fellowship in the Spirit. This is one of the Greek words that every Baptist knows. Koinonia. I'm a member of the Koinonia Sunday school class at Travis Avenue. Already Paul has referred to their partnership in the gospel in chapter 1. And in chapter four, he refers to their financial partnership in giving and receiving. But here the word likely takes on a bit of a deeper meaning, a communion, a common sharing or possession of the Spirit. As 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us, for in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greek, slaves are free, all were made to drink of one Spirit. 
spirit. The fourth conditional clause. If there is any affection and sympathy, as the ESV translates, both are actually plural in Greek. Some versions translate tenderness and compassion. The word translated affection in the ESV is the same word that is used in chapter 1, verse 8, where Paul says, I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. Both of these words actually appear together in another of Paul's prison epistles in Colossians 3.12 with one modifying the other as Paul urged them, the Colossians, to put on compassionate hearts. Or I like the old King James translation here, bowels of mercy. It's the only clause that has no further modifiers. The first clause, if there's any encouragement in Christ. The second one, comfort from love. The third one, participation in the Spirit. But here, simply, if there's any affection and sympathy. Paul is likely simply reminding them of the affection and the sympathy that believers have for one another, which then leads to the imperative in the next verse, complete my joy. If there is any encouragement in Christ, and there is, if there is any comfort from love, and there is, if there is any participation or or common sharing of the Spirit, and there is, if there are affections and mercies, sympathies, and there are, then Paul pleads with them to fulfill his joy in verse 2, which leads us to the call to unity, and the essence of unity. In verse 2, there are three or four phrases, depending upon how you understand the grammar, but there's one central idea in verse 2, and that is the call to unity. Here we encounter one of Paul's favorite words in the letter, It's the word that, a verb that would be translated to think. It occurs 10 times in Philippians alone and twice in this verse. Literally what Paul says in verse two, he asked them to fulfill his joy by thinking the same thing, by having the same love. Souls together, thinking the one thing. So the first clause and the last clause are virtually identical. To think the same thing, to think the one thing, and they're joined by the phrase, having the same love, which of course refers to God's love and our love for each other. Love is that Christian virtue that as he writes in Colossians 3, that binds everything together in perfect harmony. It is a call to unity. It is the opposite of being divided. In chapter four, Paul will implore, he will urge two women in the church, Euodia and Syntyche, to think the same thing, which translations typically say to agree. Paul does this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10, where he appeals to them, the divided Corinthians. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all say the same thing, which means to agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. There's another passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, that resonates in many ways with the key themes in Philippians. It it captures Paul's sentiment well where he writes to the Corinthian church in his second letter these words, rejoice, be reconciled, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of peace will be with you. But what does Paul mean when he says to think the one thing, because the content of the one thing is not explicitly stated, but the context indicates that Paul is speaking 
of a unity that is the product of living out the full implications of the gospel. To think the same thing or to think the one thing is a settled disposition grounded in common values. It's a common outlook seeking the same goal. It is a whole mindset of spiritual oneness. Christ who unites believers, the advance of the gospel, the glory of God in Christ. We see this kind of thinking, if you will, throughout the letter. For example, in chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, Paul prays that their love may abound, that they may be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the praise and glory of God. In chapter 1, verse 12, he says, I want you to know that what has happened to me has turned out for the advance of the gospel. In 1, 20 to 21, it is my earnest expectation that Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. In chapter one, verses 25 to 26, he says, I will remain and continue with you for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me, you might have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. In 127, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. In 2, 9 to 11, Jesus has been exalted and given the name above every name that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. In 2.16, he tells them to hold fast to the word of life. In 3.3, he says, we worship by the Spirit of God and we glory in Christ Jesus. In 3.8-10, he says, I count everything as lost because of, of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. And in 3.14-15, to 15, he says, one thing I do. I press on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven and we await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. And he concludes the letter by saying, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's the one thing. It is the gospel and everything that the gospel entails. It is expressed by Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 23, when he says, I do all things for the gospel that I might participate in it. So the basis of unity, the call to unity, and the essence of unity centered around the gospel and then third, the path to unity. And here's where it gets difficult. Because the path to unity is genuine humility, which is so contrary to our nature. But the path to unity is through humility. Unity cannot be achieved apart from it. And so what Paul does in verses three and four is he first identifies the obstacles to unity, the opposite of humility, and then he shows us the path to unity and defines it for us. So Paul defines humility first in its opposition to certain attitudes and by what those attitudes seek to achieve in the community. The first two are negative attitudes or obstacles to unity. Look at it in verse three. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. The first one is selfish ambition also translated selfishness, sometimes translated hostilities, sometimes rivalries. It's the same word that Paul used in chapter 1, verse 17 with reference to those who preach Christ out of selfish motives. This is a word that is listed among the works of the flesh in other places in Paul. Paul. 
For example, when he writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12, 20, he says to them, I fear that when I come, I may find you not as I wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling and jealousy and anger and hostilities, the same word, slander and gossip, conceit and disorder. It's listed among the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19 to 20, where Paul says the works of the flesh are evident Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries. Same word. Dissensions, division. James uses the term to describe the wisdom that is not from above when he says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Selfish ambition stands in the way of unity. The second word is translated by the ESV as conceit. It's the only time this word appears in the New Testament. The adjective appears uh, in Galatians. It's actually the combination of two words, and you see this in some English translations, the word empty and the word glory. Um, The Greek lexicon defines this word as a vain or exaggerated self-evaluation. Conceit, NIV, vain conceit. New American Standard, empty glory. And I still like the KJV on this one. Vain glory, vain glory. This word appears, the adjective of form appears in Galatians 5 where where Paul says, let us not become conceited. And then he somewhat explains or perhaps defines or shows the outcome of conceit when he says, provoking one another and envying one another. Where there's pride, there's gonna be irritation. Pride irritates and it incites rivalries. Perhaps Paul uses the term empty glory in anticipation of the following passage, which speaks of Jesus emptying himself, but then to be given the name above every name to the glory of God the Father. Walter Hansen in his commentary on Philippians says this, quote, the empty glory gained by selfish ambition stands in absolute contrast to the glory given to God when Christ, who emptied himself and humbled himself, is exalted by God to the highest place of praise to receive universal worship. And then Paul follows these two negative attitudes, these two obstacles with two more positive statements. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves, literally as count one another as surpassing yourself. Paul uses this word again in chapter three when he says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of the knowledge of Christ. And in chapter four when he says the peace There's a peace that passes or surpasses all understanding. And then in verse four, which is perhaps parallel to or explanatory to what he says in verse three, each one of you singular, looking out not for your own things, but each plural, that is everyone, for the things of others. Each one of us individually looking out not for our own things, our own interest, but each, plural, everyone, looking out for the good of the community, for the good of everyone. Galatians 6, 2 tells us we fulfill the law of Christ when we bear one another's burdens. Peter exhorts in chapter 5, verse 5 of 1 Peter, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We must stop setting our minds on our own ambitions and our own empty glory. 
Self-fulfillment, self-advancement are not the attitudes that promote unity in the church. Paul countered the Corinthian pride with exhortations such as these. In 1 Corinthians 1.31, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, 24, and 31, let no one seek his own good, but the good of the other. And whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And in that great chapter 13, the chapter on love, he says many things about love, but one thing he says about love is love does not envy or boast, and it is not puffed up. The highest good for all is rooted in godliness and righteousness and virtue. In the great wisdom passage in James 3, 13 to 18, James tells us that God's wisdom produces humility, which is demonstrated in our conduct, which yields a harvest of righteousness, which is sown in peace. So the pathway, the pathway to unity is through humility. Well, there's nothing like a great example, is there? And we have in Philippians that our faculty and those preaching will unfold for us in the coming weeks. We have in Philippians not only the call to unity, but we have examples of what this looks like. Of course, the example is Jesus, who in the next passage, Paul tells us that he took upon himself the form of a servant, and he humbled himself in obedience to death, even the death of the cross. But we also see it in the life of Paul. In fact, we've already seen it in chapter 1 in Paul. We've already seen the principle of putting others before self. Remember when Paul was contemplating whether he wanted to depart or to remain, and he said, well, I'm really hard-pressed. I mean, you know, to depart and to be with Christ is better by far. But to remain in the flesh is more needful for you, for your joy and your progress in the faith, so that you may have opportunity to glory in Christ in me. So Paul was willing to put glory aside for a while to remain for them. That's putting others before yourself. We're gonna see it later in chapter two in Timothy. Paul tells them, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your well-being. That's putting others before self. And we'll see it also in chapter two in uh, the person of Epaphroditus, who Paul says, nearly died, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So there are examples. Well, in conclusion, I want to read one more passage. It's simply to say this, that unity requires great effort. It requires determination. We have to intentionally put others before ourselves, And this is, this is captured in Ephesians, another prison letter in Ephesians chapter four, verses one to three, and I conclude with this. Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager, or some translations, being diligent. The NET, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's hard work. It's hard work.